Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Desks and Dorks, your favorite board game design and creation podcast that, as always, is brought to you by you. We bring you the best at indie tabletop gaming. I'm Kyle. I'm the dork to Riley's desk, and uh, you're watching Desks and Dorks. If you have not yet, hop over to itch.io, go find Desks and Dorks on there, and get yourself a copy of Becoming Banana Bread. It's our new $1 one-page role-playing game. We're super proud of it, um, and it's one of the games that we absolutely love the most. And if you are interested in leading a banana cult to eternal glory, uh, then you can go ahead and you can pick yourself up a copy for one whole dollar. That's right, one whole dollar. Uh, and if you were at Safe, which is Save Against Fear, uh, you can actually get to you actually probably got to see the game played, and uh, you can watch gameplay of it right now on our YouTube channel. So if you're curious about it, then uh, you know go go check it out, and then you know maybe buy yourself a one dollar one page role playing game and continue to support great indie tabletop gaming in general. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're doing today. Uh, this is not the unmatched tier list. Don't worry. I will be revisiting that at some point soon. Uh, but this is the, uh, if this says limited sets tier list, like the health of their limited environment, uh, which is going to be interesting to think about. Um, I am somebody who is a primarily a limited specialist. I've drafted more than almost anybody uh, that I know, and I used to work in that capacity for a couple different websites. It's the thing I like most about Magic. So this is primarily going to be on how good these sets were as a limited set. However, I'm also going to take into account the health and ability of some of these singles. Uh, so like, if it had a lot of cool stuff that contributed to Commander or Modern or Legacy, um, I'm not as big in those formats as I am into Limited and Standard and Pauper. Uh, but I'm going to try my best. So this is primarily going to be limited. I might talk a little bit about some of the other health of the cards uh, that those sets contributed. Um, with that being said, too, uh, there's an inconclusive because I took a little break. So, for example, uh, I didn't get a chance to play Kaldheim or Ikoria. Uh, I did get a little bit of Kaldheim. Uh, that's Zendikar Rising. I did play that one. Uh, I didn't get a chance to play the 2020 or 20, uh, sorry, the 21 core set. So that is not going to be in there. Those two, if you're excited about those rankings... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to put those there because I didn't get a chance to play those. As for the rest of the tier list, an S is amazing, a cream of the crop, as good as it gets. An A is super awesome, a B is just really solid, a C is average, a D is below average, and an F is a, a set that you might have to pay me to draft. So, uh, let's start off with the brand new set. Dominaria United actually gets a big, fat A tier. This set is super cool. Uh, I love the fact that Domain is back, Kicker is back. Uh, there are tons of really interesting multicolored strategies, and you can kind of make everything work. Uh, you'll notice that I really like sets where every option, every color is a, a viable option. Uh, you'll notice that I favor sets that have really interesting drafting patterns that aren't super swingy, like where one card just wins you the game. There are certainly great cards like that. I'm looking at Shieldred, for example, or something like the, uh, the Shiv and Devastator. Those certainly do have some impact on the limited environment, but again, those are like mythic rares. Um, and even like sh in the case of Shieldred, uh, it's not an absolute slam dunk. You can you can 100% like 3-0 or 5-0 a draft uh, in Dominaria United with just commons and uncommons and just random good cards. So my pick for that is going to be a nice big ol' A tier. I don't know if this is going to be controversial or not, but uh, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is a wasted potential. This is, in, in my opinion, if you watch the deskies, this was our like number one pick for like the T Dragon Society Award for biggest abomination in board gaming. Uh, this set was terrible, um, and for there's a number of different reasons. There was a two color combination, black red, that was infinitely better than anything else you could draft. Uh, you had a number of really swingy bombs. Uh, you had an inconsistent drafting environment. Uh, I heard one player who I, you know, uh, somebody who used to do a lot of judging and still does playing with me, um, phrased it really well. This was an undercooked core set that they wrapped in Dungeons and Dragons flavor uh, in order to sell it to us. And uh, it, that, that feels 100% correct. I have probably drafted this 15, 20 times. And I don't think I've ever actually enjoyed a single time that I've drafted this set. So, yeah. And I think too, good Lord, like... And also, too, while we're talking about why this is such a failure, they whiffed on so many classic characters in Dungeons & Dragons. The Taras is probably the biggest offender of, like, why is this even in the set? This is such a terrible flavor fail. Like, why would you incorporate this? Why would you enjoy this? Why would you put this in? Um, but, like, the Taras is super bad. Asmodeus was nearly not nearly as cool as he could have been. Um, 
the what is it the master of pedals uh bahamut's secret monk form planeswalker was pretty terrible and like at every single turn when they could have made something cool it just feels like they really failed so a hundred percent just putting this in the f tier and i don't think that's controversial i think a lot of I think a lot of D&D players liked this set. I think a lot of people who like Magic for Magic did not. Streets of New Capenna. If we were going to put this in terms of my enjoyment drafting it, it would be an S tier. I love, uh, for whatever, you can just force white green in this set and it's really good. Um, I think everyone at this point knows that you can make a really good broker's deck with very little effort. Um, like, I'm like, I'm like, I was like a 68, 70% win rate or something like this for the first 100 games or first 100 drafts that I did on, uh, arena but uh, it's a d tier i mean i don't think anybody really enjoyed streets of new cabana i think it is slightly better than our old pals adventures in the forgotten realms but i you know it man this did not do a whole lot i will say it did add some interesting cards the fact that ledger shredder exists on licensed hearse um xander for like the commander players i think Ziatora and like all of the other different um you know, family heads added a lot for Commander. I re- as a Pauper player, Inspiring Overseer was a cool addition. The uh, the tap lands that you can sack to draw cards were cool additions. So, like, all of that, you know, winds up being kind of interesting and kind of cool. But it's not enough to save this set from a pretty abysmal rating. Double Masters 2022. If I was going just purely on... Here's the thing. I want to give this a higher grade. Most master sets are at the very least competent, but I'm going to put it in the C tier, and here's why. Wizards continues to tell us that they're putting certain cards into a set uh, for the limited experience, but when you are paying, what was it, like $20 a pack for double masters, you don't want to get really crappy cards, and I'm going to be completely and totally honest with you, too. Like, sure, you can put stuff in for the draft environment, but then... Like, stuff like, you know, Phyrexian Altar or whatever the three-mana Naya spell was that, like, does five damage divided however you want it, and then somebody has to gain five life. Like, that's terrible. Like, that's not fun or playable in draft, and so we're going to get rid of it. So, uh, sad that this actually winds up being, like, as bad as it was, but could be worse. M20, I'm going to put in the B tier. This was... So, if, if Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is an example of how bad a core set can be... M20 was a good example of how solid a core set could be. Um, it didn't do anything super, super well. Uh, it, it's like the good peanut butter and jelly sandwich of, of formats. Like, it wasn't anything mind-boggling or, like, game-breaking or super interesting or really intriguing. It was just a really solid, enjoyable set. So, following along with that, hey, Double Masters is also a really solid, enjoyable set. Uh, same reasons that this is on the tier list as uh, Core Set 2020. Again, they weren't like there was nothing like overly game breaking or frustrating about either of these ones, but there was nothing noteworthy either. Again, this is like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich and vanilla ice cream of things. Are they good? Yes. Above average? Absolutely. Are they like amazing? No, uh, not really. So, uh, Guilds of Ravnica. I really liked Guilds of Ravnica. I want to put it in the A tier, but I'm gonna put it up. Here. Ah, man. I'm going to put it in the A tier. I am going to put it in the A tier. So here's the thing. I loved Guilds of Ravnica. I think the set was super fun and super intriguing. With the exception of like drafting the Boros Guild. Uh, The Boros Guild, not necessarily super great within the Guilds of Ravnica. But Izzet and Demir were super fun. There were some really good Golgari strategies. And you know what? You could kind of squeeze out um, like a really strong... Why am I struggling? Actually, no, I am going to put it in in the B tier. It was fine. It was like... Here's the thing. I liked it more than I liked Core Set 2020 and more than I liked Double Masters. Um, But looking back at the time that I spent with Guilds of Ravnica, was it the most fun I've had drafting a Ravnica-based Core Set in the last couple years? No. Um, And again, it felt like this was a good case of like, it felt like if you could be in the good base blue deck, you were usually going to be great. Uh, Whether that was Izzet or Demir didn't really matter. And yeah, you could kind of force some wins with, um, you know, with Boros, or you could do some cool value stuff with Golgari. But again, it just wasn't that super great. Um, again, not super great, but it was still good. Very good. Call time, I'm going to put in the inconclusive. I didn't play enough call time. Um, and when I say I didn't play enough call time, like three or four drafts for me is not enough, I think, to get a good... Um, 
like read on a set. Like I have drafted Ikoria, I think twice, like M21, like twice and called him like three or four times. No, like four or five times. I don't think I, that's enough to get a good read on it. So uh, I just want to put an inconclusive just in the interest of being totally and completely, uh, whatchamacallit, just honest and, and fair. Modern Horizons uh, 1 is going to go up here in the B tier, and so is Modern Horizons 2. Um, it's These can be interchangeable. I actually think I like the first Modern Horizons as a limited format better than I like the second Modern Horizons as a limited format. Um, a lot of the same things that I will say about the core set and Double Masters, I think these did better. So this was a accessible experience with super powerful cards that felt more balanced and I felt like you could do more exciting things with these two formats than I do with uh, M20 and with Double Masters. Um, let's not talk about <laughs> for Modern Horizons 2. We're not going to talk about things like Urza Saga or like Ragavan or like Murktide Regent and like what those have done to Magic the Gathering's structured formats. We're not going to talk about that um in terms of like that uh I, I, these are just fine draft formats in particular i think modern horizons one is probably the best example of a strong uh b tier format in general i really liked this one in particular um i thought like the ninjutsu stuff you could do was kind of cool there was a super fun like red black sack deck that existed um yeah it's just again there was a lot of cool fun stuff that you could do in modern horizons one and so it's like almost on the a tier but not necessarily so that being said, though, I really liked Midnight Hunt. Um, there's a lot of things that I liked about Midnight Hunt. Midnight Hunt felt like a return to form after a couple really disappointing draft sets that I have played. Um, it just, it was not, how do I put this? Every single one of the archetypes felt meaty. It felt well explored. You could do some cool stuff with the, you know, the decaying zombie tokens. Uh, there was like a really cool like black green ag like value deck that you could do. There were tons of like white X decks, whether those were tempo or aggro, it didn't matter. You could draft those as well. And I'm gonna be completely honest. It was entirely possible to do more ambitious three and four color decks as well. I really enjoyed the set, and you know, the more that I played it, the more that I enjoy, the more I found myself enjoying Midnight Hunt. Almost in spite of the fact that it was a solid set, but it was a solid set that just kept or just keeps, <laughs> just keeps doing everything well, time and time again. It just kept doing things and impressing the heck out of me. Uh, I really, really did enjoy Midnight Hunt. So, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty is going straight to the S tier. This set made me forget that I hated magic again. This set made my brother forget that he hated magic. And Colin, my brother, has quit magic way before I did. Um, and I came back to it. He hasn't. But opening packs of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty made us feel like kids again. The format is so fun. Yes, I know that red is uh, a weak color. But as what usually happens in a great design format, if something is demonstrably worse than some of the other colors then it being underdrafted leads you to getting some really nutty red decks um, and you totally can but this was the first time that i have experienced where mono color decks three color decks two color decks four color decks five color decks all of those were viable in limited i watched somebody you know rip like four okiba reckoner raids and play mono black and kill every one of their opponents in like under two turns I have played like a Naya value deck with a ton of like, like red, white, and green shrines. That was the weirdest thing, and it wound up working. Like, you can do so much cool stuff in this format. There's something for everybody. There's something for your, you know, your aggressive aggro players. There's something for your, you know, your brewers who just want to try off the wall stuff. There's stuff for your like spikes, like me, who want to win games because you can just eke out value from like the craziest places. This set was awesome. Everything from the, the draft archetypes to the flavor of the cards was really good. Yes, I know red was underpowered in this set, but you know what? It was such an amazing set. And I, I you know, I, I really cannot wait for this to come back. I really enjoyed it. Ravnica Allegiance. I'm actually going to put Ravnica Allegiance right in between Dominaria United and Midnight Hunt. Unlike the Guilds of Ravnica, Ravnica Allegiance felt like you weren't forced into two color combinations quite as much. Part of that was the Azorius and Simic guilds, I thought, did or had a much easier time um, getting access to some really cool stuff 
and uh, you could play like a more value strategy. There was a Gates deck that was floating around that was super cool. The Orzhov Guild um, had some really interesting like controly strategies with like uh, what was it? it was like ill gotten tithes or whatever. It was a four mana enchantment that would ping your opponent and give you a life every turn. It was just a weird set. <laughs> it was a weird set that I think the more people sunk their teeth into it, the more they realized how much stuff there was to do beyond those initial two color pairings and that was really what i was missing with guilds of ravnica where it felt like you were forced into those two color pairings whereas with ravnica allegiance you could play like a hundred percent you could play the guilds but you could play off off meta like two color decks and still do very well you could splash uh, other cards in a guild and do very well and you could play flat out three and four color decks and still do pretty decently as well um, ravnica allegiance was a very well designed set so Ah, uh, Strixhaven. I, I'm going to put Strixhaven at the top of the A tier. It is almost an S tier for me. I loved Strixhaven School of Mages. Strixhaven fixed a lot of problems that I have with limited environments for a number of different reasons. It gave you access to common multicolor split lands that you could use to scry. So it helps fix the flood and mana screw. Uh, problems. They had modal dual face cards, again, helping you to fix the flood and mana screw problems. And it had the learn mechanic, which basically gave you access to a separate deck. You know what? I'm putting in the S tier. I don't care. Um, the de it just rocked. It felt like someone was like, what if we made a legacy cube or a power cube, but made it into a full-fledged Magic the Gathering set? Uh, it wasn't always the most even experience. You can 100% get blown out by some like random stuff. But I have to tell you right now, I... I love 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 and adore Strixhaven for what it did uh, which was in uh, many ways address some of the biggest problems in magic like mana screw and mana flood uh, so that was super awesome also the flavor of the set I thought was really cool and again like you could do the you know the two color mage pairs or you could do three and four color decks again I think this was one that like I think people solved fairly quickly where they're like oh the blue green red ramp deck is the best thing to draft in the format but but even with that solved, I don't think it matters. I think it's still a really fun format. I almost want to put uh, Theros Beyond Death in the inconclusive because I played like eight drafts of this, ten drafts of this. I just did. Eh. I'm going to put it in C tier. It just felt fine. Uh, I, I really should like it. And maybe that I'll be fully honest. It could be my bias because I love the original Theros block. But like it just, it just felt fine. I don't know. This is the weakest reasoning. You can clown me in the comments for this one. Uh, maybe I, maybe 10 drafts is not enough. Uh, Throne of Eldraine, on the other hand. Man, that is a strong A tier for me. Uh, okay, hear me out. A lot of our opinions about Throne of Eldraine have been colored by how absolutely freaking busted Throne of Eldraine was for every constructed format, right? Like, you had the Adventure deck, and you had Edgewall Innkeeper, and you had the Giant that, uh, what is it, Bone Crusher Giant, and then, like, Brazen Borrower, and Oko, dear god, Oko. Like, the summer of Oko is, like, one of the worst times to play Magic. It just was. But if you take all of that stuff out, out of the equation, right? If you take its, its tr like, horrendous, atrocious impact on Constructed out of the equation, this was a remarkably fun set to draft. Um, this was a set that captures a lot of the best parts of magic, right? Getting value from individual creatures, um, combining cool flavor with interesting mechanics that fit the game world, having every color combination be viable, uh, you know, giving options for really interesting off the wall decks that you could try to draft, like the enchantment deck or the mill deck that existed in Throne of Eldraine was, was interesting. This was an interesting limited format that offered depth and nuance and interesting creatures and strong value. This is probably one of the best sets that I have ever played for sealed as well. Um, I know we haven't talked about Sealed a whole lot in this video, but like Sealed Throne of Eldraine was super fun because a lot of times in Sealed, if you don't have like strong value cards, you just kind of lose. But like because the cards had adventure, so you could cast them and then cast them as a creature, um, you, you could really do a lot with this set. And again, I think if we separate Throne of Eldraine's frankly stupid <laughs> impact on constructed magic and we, we dial it back to talk about how it was as a limited format, um, I, I think you'll you'll discover that this was a super fun set to draft and enjoy. That being said, Time Spiral Remastered is the best set of all of these. Uh, Time Spiral as a block worked to capture the 
best parts of magic imaginable. Um, and Time Spiral Remaster is a complicated set. I will fully admit that this is me talking like a nuts and bolts spike about a magic set and realizing that I love it because it is so... Uh, it's just so good. Yes, it takes a lot to learn this particular set. But, search your feelings. The idea behind things like Morph, which adds a ton of depth to creature combat. Suspend, which allowed you to, to play more expensive cards in a more interesting way. Um, the you know, access to multicolor mana fixing, the cool rares, the interesting rares, the powerful uncommons, the commons that got work done. Uh, Time Spiral Remastered is everything a remastered magic product should be. Uh, the only mark against this set is that it was underprinted by a lot. Um, and that's okay, because as much as I want to hate them for that, this was still, by far and away, one of the best limited experiences of the last couple years. And I think we would be remiss to put Time Spiral Remastered anywhere other than the top of the S tier, and by far and away the best limited format that I have played in recent memory. Um, I am sad that I only got a small ish amount of drafts in on this set like kamigawa neon dynasty i've drafted like 40 times or whatever and time spiral i've gotten like seven or eight but like even those seven or eight times it was so worth every single penny you know it wasn't worth every single penny is freaking set zendikar rising terrible <laughs> i i hated zendikar rising i am so sorry uh this felt like um everything that i disliked about dungeons and dragons adventures in the forgotten realms but without the fun flavor i felt like you could just get blown out i felt like there was just a bunch of random cards that just resulted in like super unfair wins uh, maybe this could be like a hundred percent me not understanding the format and not really getting it and not really enjoying it but like i you know what I, i'm gonna put on the d tier i i, I don't want to say it's as bad as adventures in the forgotten realms because that sets just dumpster juice um, but again, I think a lot of the things that I disliked about Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, I think Zendikar Rising had as well. Crimson Vow, Crimson Vow, I think this set's kind of mid. Uh, is it better than Streets of New Capenna? Yes. Uh, not by much, though. This is what we call a Prince set. So Crimson Vow is widely defined by the rares. Uh, did you get a really busted rare? D good. Then you get to win the game. Did you not get a really busted rare? Sad day. Sad, sad boy hours. You get to lose. Um, this felt like Fate Reforged for those of you who have drafted the original cons block. Fate Reforged, we, all, we used to call the Fate Reforged Lottery because it was literally just, did you get a great rare? Sure, but the commons and uncommons in that set and then a strong suite of like common and uncommon removal really kind of helped that set from being as bad. As Crimson Vow feels, which again, Crimson Vow just feels like flipping a coin, and sometimes you win the flip, and sometimes you you get eaten alive by Toxril. So, you know, yeah, it's it's to again like it has its place. It's not horrible. Like I'm drafting this in person, I think this Friday, but like it's yeah, it's not amazing. So, gets a D. All right, uh, War of the Spark is going to be a controversial one. I'm not putting it in C tier. Um. I'm going to put it in the second highest spot of B tier. War of Spark had some really cool stuff. The addition of Proliferate in particular, I thought was a really interesting um, draft mechanic. And I actually really enjoyed the way that Proliferate was used in this particular set. Um, also too, actually, you know what? I'm going to bump it to the top of the B tier. The more I think about it, because the, the use of, of uncommon planeswalkers was such a weird thing. And I remember everyone was like, how are they going to do this with like 40 plus planeswalkers or whatever ridiculous number it was? I know it's not really 40, but like, how are they going to do that and have this be a competent, well put together limited set? And honestly, it kind of was actually, nope, no, I'm going to put it back on our modern horizons. I'm sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to flip flop these a little bit. This one definitely felt like you were better off doing only two color combinations. There were a couple really good rares, like amass the dread horde, uh, assemble the God eternals. Uh, those two just immediately spring to or like massacre girl that were just so totally one-sided and would like wind up screwing you over and like having you just get blown out. But for the most part, this was a really fun draft environment. Proliferate, like I said, was a pretty good one. There was like a spells matter, like a blue red spells matter deck that was kind of cool. A, a mass as a mechanic I thought was actually really interesting. And there were some cool ways for you to play multicolor decks or like more intriguing, like brewer off the wall kind of decks too. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this. I, 
I think this is pretty good. Let me just see if there's anything I want to change. I like my S tier. I like my A tier. Uh, I almost want to put this above Dominaria United. This could change. I've only done Dominaria United like 12 times. Ravnica Allegiance, I did like 40. <laughs> so that might change. I think I like that there. Yeah, I think that's fine. That's fine. I think my inconclusives are fine. This belongs here. Stay in the garbage. I almost want to put this back. Oh, I don't like either of those. Yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I hate you, Zendikar Rising. I think you're terrible. All right, and I think that's our tier list. If you guys agree, let me know in the comments. Uh, if you disagree, you can also let me know in the comments. If you would be interested, I would love to revisit this and then maybe do uh, another tier list that is like about older Magic the Gathering sets because I have been drafting Magic for a very long time. Uh, but again, if you have not yet, go check out uh, itch.io and drive through RPG. You can get yourself a copy of Becoming a Banana Bread uh, for one whole dollar. And uh, you know what else? I really hope you all had a great time and that you enjoy it. Uh, I'm Kyle Ott for Desks and Dorks. I'll talk to you later. Peace.